Um, so um, I was asked to um, talk about Komen's goal to decrease mortality by 50 percent, um, and I was asked um, why it was set and how we're going to do it, um, and I'll do my best there. Um, it's, uh, it's certainly an ambitious goal. And what I thought I would do um, is just review a little bit where we've been over the last 25 years, just quickly show you how much progress has actually been made, um, and then talk about what I think the two challenges are if we're going to um, achieve this goal. And I'm going to do this pretty quickly so that you all can have a break. So when I started as a medical oncologist, being a breast cancer doctor, um, it technically was 1989, not 1990, but this is close enough. But for the past uh, 28 years, this is what I've been doing. And in 1990, there were 150,000 cases and there were 44,000 deaths. So fewer cases, but not that many more deaths than today. Um, breast cancer was a totally different story then. Um, we viewed it as a single monolithic disease. We did not talk about subtypes. No one used the word subtypes of breast cancer. Um, most women weren't diagnosed with a mammogram. Most women were diagnosed because they had a lump or a mass. Um, women um, in 1989 still very infrequently had uh, a lumpectomy. Most had a mastectomy. It was, in fact, only a few years after a time when women were having radical mastectomies. And in my practice back in 1989 and 1990, I certainly saw many women who six and eight and ten years before had had radical mastectomies, which, as you know, are no better than, than lesser surgical procedures. Um, and um, adjuvant chemotherapy and hormonal therapy were really new on the scene. And for women who had metastatic breast cancer, um, it was actually pretty dismal. Um, and um, I'm, I'm sorry um, that um, some of you probably know women who had metastatic breast cancer in that era, and you know that it wasn't great. There wasn't a lot of treatment. It wasn't very effective. Um, and a lot of women spent a lot of time in the hospital being pretty darn sick. Um, we were doing, I wasn't, but my colleagues were doing bone marrow transplants for breast cancer, giving ultra high doses of chemotherapy in combination with getting the, the, the patient's own bone marrow infused back in to, to um, to allow for these high doses of, of chemotherapy. The treatment didn't work um, very well, as we subsequently found out. It wasn't worse than other things. It was just no better. Um, but it, was, it, it, too, was pretty horrific. And I, I will share that walking through the, the breast cancer bone marrow transplant unit at Duke, um, where I trained in 1989, felt like I was walking through some um, pretty bad experience. Um, and I'll, I'll just let you all use your imagination. Um, women were scared, uninformed, um, and, um, and didn't really feel like their doctors talked to them. Uh, I know there are some people who feel that today as well, but it's less common, I hope. Um, and um, breast cancer advocacy was just in its infancy. So what's happened? much less extensive surgery. Our surgical colleagues um, really have been leading the way for the last 10 and 20 years saying, how little can we do and still achieve the same outcomes? And the truth is, in a lot of women, it's a lot less than it used to be. Um, we've seen reductions in the late side effects from things like radiation, and, and treatment schedules have become much more convenient. There have been advances in chemotherapy and in endocrine or hormonal therapy. And of course, HER2 positive uh, breast cancer has benefited from all of the anti-HER2 agents. And I think what all of this is about is greater individualization. And even for women with metastatic breast cancer, and I had clinic yesterday, um, as did Ian, and in my clinic, I actually, it was a very, very busy day that went from 8 in the morning to 7.30 at night, and I, um, had uh, 
25 plus patients of whom probably 18 had metastatic breast cancer, many of whom had been living with metastatic breast cancer for three years, five years, eight years, 10 years, what have you. Um, women with metastatic breast cancer live longer and live better. We have um, new treatments that um, have been clearly demonstrated to improve survival. We have a, a plethora of agents for HER2 positive disease. We have new approaches with radiation for certain times, certain types of metastases like brain metastases that I'm going to talk about in just a minute. And I think it's fair to say that quality of life and symptom management are much better, not that we have eliminated suffering, because I can assure you we haven't. Um, there still is way too much of it. But um, no longer are people spending long periods of time in the hospital. And I think that if you have to point to one advance in the last 25 years that has fueled much of the progress, it's the concept of heterogeneity, that not all breast cancers are the same. You can take this concept from looking at patients to even looking at tumors, because we're increasingly learning that tumors are not composed of the same uniform population, but are the, the, that are composed of many different kinds of cells. This is the kind of work that people um, like Nick are pursuing. And some of this came from very early studies. The, these are looking at the genes um, um, expressed by looking at RNA, um, and, um, and which demonstrated that, although it's hard to see here, that breast cancer sorted itself out into several distinct patterns genetically. And interestingly, those distinct patterns not only correlated with how women did, but correlated with other clinical features. So when we talk about breast cancer today, we don't talk about breast cancer. We talk about triple negative breast cancer, and we talk about HER2 positive breast cancer, and we talk about estrogen receptor positive breast cancer that's typically HER2 negative. And when we talk about that, we talk about some of the cancers as being very slow growing and some that are faster growing. And we really think of breast cancer not as a disease, but as a family of diseases. Here I've, I've, I've got four siblings. In fact, they're probably somewhere in the range, I would guess, of six to 12 distinct subtypes of breast cancer. And within each of those, there are going to be some, um, so there's going to be some variability. But this is, when it comes down to it, where we still are in 2016. I, I should have updated it for 2017. I can assure you it has not changed in, in the last three months. Um, there um, were estimated to be just under 250,000 cases of invasive breast cancer in the United States, 61,000 cases of DCIS, over 40,000 deaths, and as I said earlier, too much suffering. And worldwide, far more. I don't think we, can ha we have accurate estimates of the number of cases worldwide, because in so many countries, they just um, simply don't have the kinds of tumor registries that we do. Um, we know that there are well over half a million deaths worldwide. So I want to just touch on two challenges because I think that we're going to have to address these challenges if we're going to even come close to achieving that 50% goal. And those two challenges are two very different areas. One is the problem of therapeutic resistance. Why treatments stop working in women who can go for treatment. And the other is the problem of health equities. Why some women and a few men um, because there are only a few men with breast cancer, but there are a few. Um, but why is it that we cannot manage to deliver care to everyone? And it's not just about um, lack of access, and it's not just about poverty, and it's not just about lack of education, and it's not just about racial disparities. It's about all of these things. And when I talk about um, health equity, and disparities in breast cancer, I point out 
that basically anything that makes you different from a middle-aged white married woman with a college education who lives in a big city um, and who's um, straight and has health insurance and on and on and on. You tick off those factors that make you different from that idealized individual and you're at risk um, for not getting quite the right health care. If you're disabled, if you're, if you're significantly overweight, all of these things. But first, let's talk about therapeutic resistance, which in truth for those women who get care is the major cause of breast cancer death. If our treatments kept working, people would never die. It's particularly a problem for triple negative breast cancer, where in fact our treatments are still really quite poor for what's called luminal B breast cancer, which is fast growing estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And for some women with HER2 positive breast cancer, over there, although there we've made so much progress that we sometimes um, forget that there are still challenges. We've had a rapid expansion of our understanding of breast cancer biology. And increasingly over the last decade in particular, the collaboration that exists between scientists and clinicians and advocates and the pharmaceutical industry, um, those collaborations have been particularly noteworthy and there was a time when you really had to beg people to work with one another and that is simply not the case. It's certainly not the case at our center, but it's not just us. It's, it's really something that, it's a, it's a movement that has, um, increasingly pervaded most academic medical centers. We're just a little luckier than some because we have more people who, who find lots of other people to work with. So I want to talk a minute about the kind of work that's going to allow us to move forward. I'm not going to show you a lot of progress here, but I'm going to show you um, an example of what I believe is the kind of work between clinicians and scientists that will make a difference. So as I mentioned before, brain metastases are a problem for patients with HER2 positive breast cancer. In truth, they're a problem for patients with triple negative breast cancer as well. But in the setting of HER2 positive breast cancer, of all of the deaths from HER2 positive breast cancer, about half of them probably are because of, of, of brain metastases. And so um, we've had a whole team working on this. So our colleague Nancy Lin, who's a clinician, a breast medical oncologist, and Keith Ligon, who's a neuropathologist, and Jean Zhao, who is a cancer biologist, all got together and they did something that's actually relatively unique. They figured out how to take tumors that were being resected in the operating room from women with metastatic breast cancer, tumors that were growing in people's brains, quickly get those to the lab and grow those tumors in the brain of a mouse. Um, and the importance of that is that, uh, is that it's brain, it's cancer that was growing in the brain and was going into a brain. Because for a long time we've thought that there may be important differences in different organs in terms of their ability to support different kinds of metastases. So I'm just going to show you just some, some, some very preliminary information. So this slide simply shows, and um, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but basically the tumors that grow out in the mouse, at least in terms of the HER2 and the estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors, and the overall appearance look just like what's in the patient. So that's the first thing you need to, to, to know. Um, if, if in fact the tumors look very different, we wouldn't be able to use a model like this. And then having seen that, what, um, what, what our colleagues did was they started testing drugs in the brain um, of these mice. Because in truth, our process of testing drugs shouldn't be just hit or miss. We don't want to just throw drugs at people without good reason. We want to use drugs rationally, use drugs um, that um, have been shown, um, at least in an animal system, to be useful. And what they were able to show is that these two drugs given together 
Um, one is what's called a PI3 kinase inhibitor. The other is what's called an mTOR inhibitor. Had remarkable effects when given together. They didn't work very well when, um, or didn't work nearly as well um, when given uh, by themselves. Um, and the, the, the next part of the story that I'd love to tell you is that we then turned to the company and did a clinical trial because they gave us the drug and that four out of the t 20 patients or some number got better with this. I can't tell you that story. And this is one of the other frustrations is that um, I can't tell you that story because in fact the company decided not to make the drug anymore because the drug for legitimate reasons was deemed to be too toxic. So unfortunately, not everything is under our control, but we are moving forward with this and looking at a, a very, very similar but different drug. But in my mind, as we think about getting past problems like drug resistance, we have to do it with very, very thoughtful approaches. But 15 years ago, I was in a meeting, and I'm a pretty clinical guy, um, and all these scientists were talking about model systems, and I, I didn't really understand why this was so important. And as time has gone on, I have, I have come to see, as we have tested more and more drugs, oftentimes without adequate preclinical data, just how important these systems are. And I, I think that, again, this is exactly the kind of work we want to do. So let's move on and talk about health equities, which is the other major problem and results in countless unnecessary deaths, not just in sub-Saharan Africa and India and Southeast Asia, but in Washington, D.C. and Mississippi and Boston. Um, and there are no reliable statistics here, but I think most people believe that somewhere in the range of a quarter to a third of the deaths from breast cancer each year in the United States could be eliminated if we eliminated problems related to, to health equities. We know that if we just look at race, that African American women do not do as well with breast cancer as white women. Um, and if we look at age, we know that older women even controlling for other medical factors. So this isn't just because old women also have congestive heart failure or diabetes or something else. But that old women, if you, if you just look at breast cancer survival in older women, um, do much worse than women who are younger, in spite of the fact that the cancers are thought to be slower growing cancers. And young women also do worse. So the extremes of age, again, a way in w ways in which someone just isn't just that that middle-aged white woman living in Manhattan with her health insurance. And so I would propose that um, one of the ways we should think about breast cancer subtypes is this. And so this isn't about different biologic subtypes, really. It is a little bit. But if you think of it, we really have two big groups of patients with breast cancer. We have a big group of women who have breast cancer that is probably not very lethal, that's found on a mammogram that would, might never threaten someone's life or might take a very, 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 very long time to ever threaten someone's life. And then we have what, for lack of a better term, I'm gonna call potentially lethal breast cancer. It's the breast cancer that, um, in spite of our best efforts, sometimes um, recurs and takes someone's life and where in the absence of treatment that would happen even more frequently. So that's along the top. So high, high proliferative rate think of as, as lethal, low proliferative rate think of as non-lethal. And then along the side you have medical care available and medical care not available. So if you have that kind of lethal breast cancer um, but you have good medical care available, the outcome is often favorable. If there's no medical care, the outcome is disastrous. And if you have one of these very, very, very slowly uh, growing cancers and you have medical care available, it's always favorable, the outcome. Probably 99% of those women do well. In truth, some of them do well even without medical care, but some don't. 
And it's why the whole issue of disparities becomes so critical. And the better our treatment gets, the more important disparities become. When we don't have good treatment, it doesn't matter if somebody can get it or not because it's not going to do them any good. It's when you have treatment that it becomes um, so unconscionable. So I do think that this is what we have to do if we're going to um, uh, make a big difference in the next 10 years. I think we have to focus both on therapeutic resistance and health equities. Why 50%? Well, I'll confess to you that that number, I believe, was sort of pulled from um, thick air. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but, um, but on the other hand, it's a number that resonates with people. It's bold. It's a meaningful goal. In truth, it's a big stretch. Because unfortunately, even though you would like to think we could just make this happen, 10 years goes by pretty quickly. And it takes you know, several years just to develop a drug. And it takes a long time to put into place social change to get rid of health equities. But it's probably a possibility with the right effort. So how do we get there? We have to address both of these problems. I think Komen is well poised to provide stimulus grants but more importantly, to motivate other organizations and governmental agents to address both of these problems. And of course, Coma needs to continue to focus on fundraising. So um, I, I, I do want to thank you. The, my last slide, I just pulled this image off the internet this morning. I didn't think it was the best example of somebody stepping on the gas. Um, <laughs> it was either this yeah, sort of it, 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 it's an old car. It sort of looks like an old foot, I, but it, 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 it's not mine. But it was either, so the, the, the choice was either a foot like this or like a, 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 a woman in like these really sort of flashy, um, you know, four inch heels with, with, you know, open toe and everything. And I decided that didn't quite look right. And so, but. But the reason I put this here is that we have made such progress in science and there are all these new drugs being developed that it's just criminal in my mind that we sometimes don't have the funding to take this to the next step and get it translated into the clinic. And this is the time where whether you wear an old black loafer or whether you wear a pump, you want to like step on that gas pedal hard and to the extent that all of you can motivate people to do that, that's a good thing. So with that I will end. I've probably gone over my time. I apologize. Um, and um, I think it's probably best to, to take a break and just answer questions that way. Or how do you want to do this? I think if anyone has, you know, we'll take one or two public questions and then we'll take our little coffee break and folks can come up. Okay. It's bad to stand between food and <laughs> people. Let's have coffee. Okay, so uh, thank you so much.